So um, I, I first want to thank everyone for, um, um, for the invitation. Uh, I, I really love the many faces of gentrification, and to a certain extent, I, I am reflecting that many face. I'm a historian by trade, so it, it seems odd that I might be here, but I thought I would sort of start off introducing or explaining, partially explaining why it is that I ended up talking about gentrification, which is outside the historical framework from which I, I normally uh, do my scholarship. So uh, actually, the sound is actually really important. I'm, I'm sorry that you're not able to hear it. Um, the sound actually is a layered piece. It's a piece that includes uh, a little bit of Drake, a little bit of traffic, um, and a little bit of a church, corner church. And the sound is important because it's, the, it's part of what drove me into this conversation about gentrification. I recreated the sounds of a summer night outside my house near Bun Terrace and Holloway Street in Durham, North Carolina. And I'm sitting there in the midst, in the night, and I'm hearing this cacophony of sound. And it hit me rather hard that one day this acoustic blackness would vanish along with the memory of a people's presence. My community in East Durham is undergoing the process of gentrification. And as gentrification moves swiftly through my community, that moment concretized for me abstract theory, right? Uh, things like market analysis and economics into an ugly reality. If sight and sound constitute remembrance, then the vulnerable are losing the battle over spatial and oral history. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and I don't know if you've seen that report, produced a report a few months ago claiming that gentrification concerns um, were overstated and that the reality instead was much brighter. There were, quote, important benefits for original residents, uh, adults and children, and few observable harms. Uh, and I'll, I'll skip some of what they in included. Um, basically, the report amounted to being close to wealthy people somehow made you a happier, wealthier person yourself, right? I think y'all know that's bullshit. <laughs> that was a scholarly term, okay? All right, so <laughs> I think, however, that we need to understand gentrification as a long-term process, and, and this is what it is as I'm coming in as a historian. And I think specifically back to my father's experience when 20 uh, years ago plus, he read the city's plan for development, and it was all about how to revitalize uh, the city of Durham without a housing solution for poor people. My father traveled up and down the community, I like to say, like a Black Paul Revere, basically screaming, the white people are coming, the white people are coming. And in the process, few people were prepared to believe him. Part of the problem is people see gentrification as a visual process. It is not visual, it operates in the dark and it operates through this drive toward infrastructure, through banks snatching up property and refusing to sell it. And so this notion that it's market driving gentrification is really a lie. It's a more deliberative, concerted process of removal, and we need to begin to understand it as such. And in part, this is why the gentrification project came about because I was fully aware not just of the looming uh, movement or displacement of black people out of East Durham, but it was also clear to me that this had been going on and in the works for a long time. So the gentrification project was designed to really examine this whole question of how gentrification was taking place. What were the strategies that city developers uh, uh, or cities and developers and uh, universities, what did they use to really push out various communities? 
This also happens similarly, uh, uh, in, or in conjunction, I should say, with um, a meeting that took place with the Institute for the Black World 21st Century. And at the time, the organization had decided that it wanted to look at black economic development. And the problem was that it kept running up against this whole question of gentrification. How can you do black economic development if there's no black community? That was a fundamental question. And so you had to reverse and go back and, to, and deal with gentrification as an issue, a, a major issue of crisis for the black community. And we'll go through here as I uh, go through. Um, and it was clear that it was a crisis. Um, and, and it was also offensive, egregious, if you will, in nature. This is actually an, an area that's right outside the downtown Durham. I don't know if you figured this out yet, but they're literally across the street from each other. This is the kind of sort of lopsided kind of development that's taking place. When we met for economic development, it was determined that the focus needed to shift from uh, focus on uh, businesses and things like that into dealing with this whole question of housing. And out of that discussion came the gentrification project, which is currently in its infancy. Uh, the project is really a method for preservation, but it's also a solution-based space, right? And it has five goals. One, give isolated or newly founded groups a training manual for how to research, unearth, and delineate the varied forces of multiple strategy and multiple strategies that facilitate gentrification. Now, I'm being kind of wordy here. How do you stop gentrification? That's what I'm really getting at, right? And, and what are the ways in which they're going about this process? The other thing is that it was clear to me that there are anti-gentrification forces out there, people who are pushing back against gentrification. The problem, however, is that none of these groups are in conversation with each other. This is a national phenomenon. So how do you provide a space that allows all of these groups, institutions, and organizations to speak to each other? and engage in or borrow from each other in terms of challenging uh, uh, gentrification. We wanted to provide a resource center, and this is particularly important for libraries. Most people don't realize I train you know, students who go into libraries. Libraries are now the front line on the issue of housing, and, which sounds surprising. But when people are displaced or are about to be displaced, they go to the public library there we go. They go to the public library as a way of finding assistance in terms of where they can find uh, uh, help for rent or for any other issues that emerge out of being displaced. And so libraries also needed resource material. And then I wanted to preserve it. In the same way I had that moment at night listening to all this different music and realizing that the sound of East Durham, the sound of my community, was not going to be there soon. I'm sorry. Can you all hear me? Because it keeps going in and out. OK, good. All right. So my students and I began to collect material. And that material formed the basis for the gentrification project. And we collect all kinds of material. We're collecting, uh, this is actually a playbill, not for sale. Uh, this is a play that a uh, Puerto Rican community, Humboldt Park in Chicago, put on as a way to educate through the arts their residents and, and ensure that they don't sort of sell over or give uh, over their property to developers. We also have started conducting oral history interviews, all right? In the process, we've collected over 239 articles, and we put them into a map. And one of the ways that we have begun to really document the deliberate process of, of uh, gentrification is to categorize the way in which it's taking place. And first and foremost is policing. 
you will see right on that corner the police. This is actually my father's house is right here, like literally where this table is, and the cops are <laughs> right there, all right? So here it is, my father is, as I said, right where that red table is, you can see the police from his house. Across the street are people who are just hanging out or engaging, you know, uh, again, you know, academias. Uh, we like to euphemistically call it the underground economy. I'm gonna let y'all figure that out. <laughs> All right, but the underground economy operates partially on that corner. Now, up until now, the police have not been a non-presence, but as the community has been um, targeted for this process of, 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 of dispossession, the police have made an appearance and they've begun to harass people. And so it's clear that police are enforcers. Let me also add that enforcers are not just police, they also include city officials. I cannot tell you how many uh, citations my father has received. There was a storm at, uh, at his house. There was a tree branch that fell. The very morning after the storm, someone was there to give him a citation for $50 for debris in his yard. Do not tell me this is market forces. That's not market forces, all right? So there's enforcement taking place, and that's a clear indication of uh, one strategy that they use for gentrification, all right? Landmark targeting. This is another element. We saw this in Atlanta uh, with Friendship Baptist Church, where the church was really the key to breaking open the black community, which was surrounded by Mor uh, Morris Brown, Clark Atlanta University, all these historically caught black colleges and universities. Uh, Friendship was a black church that had been around since almost the late 1800s. So the moment they were able to push out the church, that opened up the door. You will notice that happened not just in Atlanta, but also in Durham. And when I say landmark targeting, landmarks don't have to be a church. This is Leo Seafood in Durham, North Carolina. It had been around almost 50 years. Uh, it was a very well-known establishment, and as part of the infrastructure changes that were taking place, they were widening the road. And the one way to get rid of Leo Seafood, of course, is by uh, eminent domain. And again, yet another tool to both uh, um, under, undermine the, 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 the cultural uh, landmarks in the community, but also as a way to get around having to pay the value of the restaurant by claiming it through eminent domain. So you cut at the businesses. Um, and Google got in on the mix because now that uh, Leo's is gone, they've misplaced Leo's and claimed that it's in another location. So this whole question of uh, um, erasure, right, is not just a function of the literal removal of the space, it's also the literal removal of memory. There are other elements that have played into this process and strategies, and I'll go quickly because I want to make sure that uh, we have time at the end. Uh, space dispossession, dispossession um, and sound colonization. Uh, space dispossession takes multiple forms. One of them, of course, is rebranding. Uh, you have in Harlem uh, the attempt to turn it from Harlem to Soho or Soha. I, I, I repeat, I, I apologize for that, Soha. Um, in uh, Cincinnati, we have Over the Rhine, which historically was a black community dating back to the early 1900s, and now they refer to it as the OTR. Uh, and I haven't gotten a picture yet, but there was a picture circulating of, um, for Harlem, basically for white residents to come in Harlem, and they had two white Americans in these kind of Brooks Brothers suits saying, Wel Harlem welcomes you, right? So this is all about reframing a community as you can come and live here now. Um, Street name changes, Malcolm X uh, 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 Boulevard in New York, they tried to change to um, uh, Lenox Avenue. 
Also, another indication, not just street name changes, but changes to infrastructure, right? All of a sudden, you get new signs come up. In Glenville, I was in Cleveland, Ohio, I was driving it, and I noticed for the first time there was this lovely little signage with brick and all kinds of stuff saying Glenville, and I thought, uh-oh, I'm like sort of like my father, I should go through the neighborhood saying the white people are coming, the white people are coming. So when you start to see those changes in infrastructure, trees go up, uh, again, these are things that have been in the works for a while, not market forces pushing these things along. Artisanal boutique and businesses, new sidewalks. This is actually in East Durham. This is a bakery that has uh, popped up. And on one corner is this bakery that is literally, uh, its clients are only white Americans and not a block. And I mean not a block, maybe half a block, is a nation of Islam temple. Uh, and so you get that kind of schizophrenic thing going on in the process. Quickly, acoustic gentrification or colonization. Um, this we see, and I, I'll skip this, uh, with regard to the sound of a neighborhood, how a, neighbor is, a neighborhood is supposed to sound. Usually enforcers are used to push out sounds uh, that are considered not appropriate for the new neighborhood. This is how you get the emergence of Don't Mute DC, uh, where you have folks partying on the corner and uh, uh, the neighbors are not happy with the sound. But you also have that happening in Durham with Batala. Batala is actually a musical group that performs annually for a major Durham art uh, and, and music fair. They have a permit to actually perform or, or, or train for their performance in the Durham Park. But residents started calling the police to complain about the drumming that was taking place. And the police did in fact come and remove them. This is in spite of the fact that they had a permit. So Batala uh, is again, just an example, but uh, we're not just talking about the sound, right? Traffic redirection, um, in Eastern Durham, what's happening is they've changed one uh, street into now a one-way, and that's to facilitate uh, cars coming off of Highway 70, Highway 85 to come into the community. Again, you have to look at these infrastructure changes that are taking place because the market all of a sudden appears when there's a change in the space that would make it somehow more appealing. All right, noise ordinances, all of a sudden you get police coming out of complaints for uh, or with regard to noise. Now, despite that, uh, there are other things that are, are, are part of this whole uh, issue of forced dispossession. You got the ripple effect uh, from the subprime Rome, uh, subprime uh, um, decline of 2008. Uh, you have university and city developers, whether it's uh, Columbia University uh, um, uh, or other institutions, they're all, all also pushing out. University of Chicago is, uh, you're going to probably hear about next because they played a central role in, uh, in doing the, 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 the restructuring of the Obama Library. And there's been a lot of conversation about what will happen to the adjacent black community. Uh, and the conversation effectively is the Obama Library will act to push people out. And there are no attached uh, elements of affordable housing at all. And of course, that's deliberate because that's the nature of the University of Chicago. Criminal activity, arson, and deed fraud. Now, this is something that makes people uncomfortable, but it's, it's a recurring with each conversation that I'm having with people and articles that we are reviewing. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon, so that we're clear. I know during the 1970s, uh, landlords were notorious for setting their apartment buildings on fire because it was cheaper to get the money. Uh, so. Uh, there are a number of cases where there has not just been uh, questions about arson, but certainly there has been outright deed fraud. In the case of New York and Brooklyn, they were removing people for water bills, even though water bills were either paid and or even if they had mounted up, they had not informed the people and the houses were sold up from under them, right? 
and opportunity zones. And opportunity zones are a funky little thing. We haven't added that to the gentrification project yet, but we are working on it. And opportunity zones can go one way or another. Um, in part, it's going to depend on the level of activists uh, and the community groups. We already know that they're going down a wayward uh, direction because of the ways in which uh, some areas have been de designated opportunity zones and there's questions about that. Um, there is uh, no process of evaluation. So supposedly opportunity zones are supposed to help with improving the community, but you don't know that because there's no evaluation method to determine whether it has in fact helped or not. Uh, but there are some, some issues that are coming out with opportunity zones. That being said, and I'm gonna check my time a little bit because I know we're kind of in a rush. Um, that being said, the process of, of, of identifying is not just about confirming what the strategies are for gentrification. Uh, we also want to look at the ways in which people have challenged uh, 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 the, the process of gentrification. And we're doing that through a map that we've created. And unfortunately, you cannot see it quite well. But each of those dots represents an area that has had an issue with gentrification. And then inside those dots, you have both the persons or entities responsible for gentrification, and that includes names of companies and corporations. If you're going to be so bold as to push people out, then I have no problem with putting your name in there. All right. In addition to that, we have the responses, anti-gentrification strategies, partly because people who need assistance need to know where they can go in their community, but also partly because we want be, people to be able to be in conversation and maybe Houston can borrow from Cleveland or Cleveland can borrow from Durham. So each of those dots actually represents a card, which you can kind of see in the corner, which has that information. All right, we're hoping to move away from this notion that gentrification, uh, gentrification is controversial. It's complicated, it's actually not complicated. You put people out so you can bring new people in. That's what it is, all right? Um, and move away from this notion that it's market forces so it's some uncontrolled entity for which there are not people or persons involved and in literally pushing the process, all right? As we said, we want it to be a community tool and, and documentation of displacement and a place for organizations and other groups to go to. But we also want to preserve small elements of lost communities, and that's through oral history interviews. Um, and let me uh, go back. In terms of uh, documenting organizations, uh, activities, and anti-gentrification, I really want to highlight three solutions because I do think that's important that any you know, discussion of gentrification has to get to these solutions. And these are solutions pulled from different places around the United States. One of the things that's come out of Brooklyn is a discussion of what do we mean when we say affordable? And this is really important because what you have is a group of people saying it's affordable and the, I mean, like uh, one gentleman already said, it's affordable and $220,000 is considered an affordable home, right? That's, that's not affordable. And that's all based on the area medium income, or also known as the AMI. The area medium income is supposed to be set against the whole average of the city. That's a problem. If you're living in a poor neighborhood, then you are, in fact, not the average of the city. So you set it outside the boundaries of the people in the community. So that's, that's really a, a, a game that people are playing. You have to set the area of median income not to the whole city. You have to set it to the neighborhood. What is the median income of the people who live in that community? So that then you can determine what they can afford and what they cannot afford. So as Durham has now pushed through this housing bond, I think it's really important that when people say push through a housing bond, you need to redefine what is the AMI so that people are clear, you're not just gonna come up with some old random number, all right? Second strategy I think has been useful and I keep pushing people to think about, and that's the Community Development Financial Institution, also known as a CDFI. I was in a previous session 
where they talked about the cost associated with building a home. Well, CDFIs remove the factor of greed. All right. If you're a developer and you're trying to make a profit and, you, uh, and you're not trying to make a small profit, let's just be honest about it, <laughs> okay, then you need to find ways to produce these homes that are affordable. CDFIs have been effective in Mississippi, in the Delta. CDFIs have emerged and provided loans to low-income people in the community. There are people who are able to get a home with a $17,000 salary. So it is, in fact it is in fact possible to provide banking services, and it is in fact possible to provide a home for someone who is working class or poor. Uh, another thing, CDFIs are another side of credit unions. Credit unions have failed to do their job. CDFIs come in as community development financial institution and its goal is to develop the community, not for the sake of a profit. And it's actually much easier than most people uh, think to set up a CDFI. There are rolling applications that you can submit to the government for setting up a CDFI and the government will be, uh, uh, set you up with a certain amount of money allotted. You have to be a nonprofit. You can't be, of course, Joe Schmo, who's like, I'm setting up a CDFI. <laughs> you have to be a nonprofit organization. But it's possible for community groups to uh, come together to set up a banking institution that will help facilitate development that's not profit oriented and or more to the point greed oriented. Finally, I, I wanna say a third thing, opportunity zones. I'll tell you it's a funky animal opportunity zone. One of the things that one might wanna consider is the fact that a lot of these opportunity zones, and there's over, uh, over 200 plus funds that have been set up. They have money sitting there and they're going to use it. How they use it in part can depend on the community. You have to force their hand. You cannot ask them to be partners. You have to insist that they be partners. And in the process, you have to insist that whoever is involved in this process, again, the, the object is not going to be an extreme amount of profit. In fact, the fact that you have your money in the opportunity zone, you've already won. And, that, and that's just the bottom line, just by saving on your taxes. Getting extra is, is, is extreme. So what you have to do is apply the pressure. The additionally, you have to uh, monitor the opportunity zones operating in your community to ensure that the money is used properly. There's a case in Baltimore where they're doing development and the development has led to some ginormous mall, right? So you have to monitor to ensure that these funds are doing what they are supposed to do. I want to say um, that for me, the gentrification project is, is, is personal. My father is right in, the, right in the middle of this process. And he's had the police, and he's had city officials, and he has had to deal with the constant barrage of emails and phone calls, and I get phone calls as well. So we have to begin to think strategically about how we understand gentrification as a deliberative process. We have to begin to think about ways that we can collaborate to challenge gentrification. And we have to think about the myriad of ways and strategies that we can do to transform the black community and maintain it. And uh, I think I'll just end it right there because of our, our, our time. But Thank you, that's it. <laughs>
And I, I just want to point out one thing very quickly. The gentrification project, you can uh, Google it. It's something that uh, has come out of uh, my work with different individuals. But I do mean for it to be a communal project. Uh, and to that end, I, I'm saying to you that you are all deputized <laughs> to give me information. I'm more than happy to put that into it. And I'm looking to work with uh, community groups who would like to use the project for their work as well. So that's just wanted to do that quick note. Can you find that map on that? Yes, the map is available on the gentrification project uh, uh, website. And just a, a note, next semester I'm going to be working with two of my classes, one Introduction to African American History and the other Race and Economy. And they're going to add 400 more cards to that map. In addition to those cards, we're going to have oral history interviews also populated into the gentrification project. So any materials that I get basically will go into that space. Uh, and I'm looking right now to make it national in part because there are different ideas coming from so many different places that I think it, the conversation has got to be broader. But I think if you're going to stop gentrification, it has to be a movement. And movement making comes from creating a mass. When you talk about history, how, uh, how, where does that start and how far forward does that go to? So are you talking about the project? I got a big mouth, so can everybody hear me? I can go louder. I can send this back to you. Okay. Oh, no, I'm, I'm fine. Curious. I mean, Do you mean for the gentrification project or the process of a dispossession or removal? Because that has been a long-term process off and on. Well, when you talk about, oh, I'm looking at solutions here, and you're talking right. about uh, preserving oral histories, yep. and you're talking about, um, oh, where is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, preserving oral histories, let's say that. So um, does that, do those oral histories, right. how far so, forward do they travel? Uh, um, okay. Considering, you know, are you looking at generational, you know, multi-generational, right. right. including the present generation and the histories right. they have created? Right. Currently, oral histories will, its application is for um, the current circumstances of gentrification. Now, there are a lot of people who have an older experience. So there's one woman I'd like to interview who's out of New York. And she has a history of uh, understanding what we call Negro removal during the 1950s and 1960s, which is an earlier form of this kind of dispossession and displacement and, and removal. But for the purposes of the gentrification project, the focus is really the oral history is supposed to do two things. One, move away from these numbers conversation because that confuses the, the actual sort of circumstances of what's happening. You have to hear people's voice voice. But two, in talking to people, they actually have their own ideas for how they think a community can and should be changed, and we're not engaging those communities. So they serve two purposes. So, so, I'm asking, so you're saying the 60s, the 60s. Right. You're saying, you mentioned 50s and 60s. Are you going into 70s, 80s, and 90s? No, it's all the way to the, what, with the current circumstances. The focus is on the current circumstances, the people who are being displaced right now. Because the confusion is not about 1950s and 1960s. Historians have written about that. It's about right now and this confused language of economics, numbers, market, and that sort of undermines the reality of the deliberate nature of it. As historians, we know it was deliberate because we've looked at the Federal Housing Authority, we've looked at the GI Bill, we've looked at the highways. But that is from a long lens. What's missing now is the long lens and, and, and it's serving to confuse people. Does that make sense? No, I'm still a little bit confused okay. because you're going okay. pretty far back. No, I'm not. I'm saying that the oral histories will be for those people who are experiencing displacement right now. But there, there's a big section in between right now and further back. There's a big yeah, but I'm not doing further back. Historians have already done further back. That, but have they done, they've done how further back? I mean, 
Have they done 70s, 80s, 90s? Oh, yes. They're historical works. Uh, afterwards, I'll give you a list of books. I have a colleague who just put out a book, Kianga, talking about the problem of housing and housing displacement in the 1980s. Historians have already done that. Yeah, it's the now that's the problem. Mm. Like that's just people. A lot of people say like, I listen to one man Antonio Boy. He talks about the racial wealth gap mm -hmm. and point out that gentrification is just like a a part of the racial wealth gap. And mm -hmm. then, um, I think on one statistic they said the middle white families were for hundred thousand to one ten. Right. But the middle black families were seventeen hundred dollars net. And I think they said um, the middle class working black mother is worth $5, mm -hmm. and the middle class black family is worth $100. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, and I know Thomas Piggy talked about the wealth calcification, that the 1% is sucking up all the resources in the wealth mm -hmm. in America. So when you look at those numbers and know about the racial wealth gap, how does that play into gentrification in your eyes? So as far as- Afro-American families can't, we can't buy the property and build in the neighborhoods that we live in. So this is part of why I mentioned the CDFI, because the CDFI meets people where they are. If you can find, and we're talking about the Mississippi Delta, these CDFIs are operating. This is one of the poorest areas in the United States. And if they're managing to help people get into homes, then we need to take a look at what is going on that they're able to facilitate that process. Those people are not any more wealthier than uh, they were almost 50, 60 years ago. So what is happening that they're able to facilitate their process? Several things has happened. One, again, they took out the profit angle. So that's a clear sort of change in terms of the intent of how much money you get out of it. Two, they've lowered the interest rate so that even if people are not, quote, meeting the, the purported uh, credit score number, by lowering the interest rate, they maintain it and they're able to keep uh, or afford it. Three, what the CDFIs also did was to keep in mind that there are circumstances that could disrupt poor black communities immediately. Things like going to a hospital or any kind of medical issues. So in conjunction with providing the low interest loans, they also provided smaller loans and worked also with smaller grants to deal with circumstances around health so that somebody didn't go under the water if there was one problem or another. Or they would extend the loan and add it on. In other words, there were ways to kind of work with the variables. Now, this is not to say that this is a permanent solution. It is to say that you don't get bogged down in the distance, because if we get bogged down in the distance, we're never going to catch up, right? That, that takes a, a period of massive amount of dollars, massive amount of transformation. But you can, in fact, get people into homes, and you can begin the process of building wealth by getting them access to homes, but not in the way that we currently operate in terms of the construction of, the, of, of market and capitalism and economy. Yes. No, 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 no. These houses are, and by the way, in Alabama, they have something called the $20,000 home that they have been doing. Auburn University only does this as a program of, of their immediate community, and they only choose one person a year. But the question is not whether you can uh, just focus on that one person year. Can you upscale a project or a program like that? It is possible, but you'd have a mat you need a larger amount or a pot of money to work with. The houses, a lot of the houses that they're uh, uh, working with in Mississippi, what they've done is instead of trying to do a new home, they've renovated the houses. Most people don't want to leave their house anyway. There's a long history and connection that people have to their homes. So if you meet, again, people where they are, you can facilitate home ownership, facilitate repair, and, and make it a livable situation. Does that make sense? No, because the closing the racial uh, wealth gap is a longer process. 
it will begin the process of closing the way, uh, racial wealth gap because you'll have a, a basis by which you begin to transfer wealth as in property from one generation to the next. But that's not something that is a, an immediate process. Does that make sense? Right. All right, we're going to have to move on. To Jeremy, right. We'll move on to the next but that's not realistic for somebody with a $17,000 salary. What is realistic is for them to have a home, to have a safe place for their kids, to have a place where they can pass that on to the next generation. Other things have to go into place. I'm not suggesting that that's not the case. But first, you have to secure people. Hello. Thank you for telling us about the PDF. I didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. But we, in the first session this morning, it was said by the speaker that he has not seen signs of gentrification in this area. And one of our city council said that he has not seen signs of gentrification in his ward. But from your talking points, you said that one of the first signs is that it's not bike lanes, it's city officials suddenly enforcing BS rules. The mm -hmm. second one is landmark parking. And for what's the second one, I would like to point out Davis Garage and that nice $30 million bus station we have now that is not being used. And mm -hmm. the third was space disposition, and they are now trying to recreate the east side into the east end. Could you please explain to our city officials who don't seem to see gentrification that we have those three signs playing out in our city right now? Yes. <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm more than happy to do it. Give me the microphone for this. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You done got me on my soapbox now. I know. I, I am doing my best to be patient because people just assume that, and, and the things that you mentioned, let me be clear, those are already divisible markers. That is not the start of gentrification, right? The start is when you start to look at the 20 year, 30 year plan. The start is with banks in California, for example, because they are in, in a lot of times working with these city officials, they have bank property and they hold that property. They will not sell it, they will not renovate it. That's another sign that something is coming. Banks, by its nature, won't profit. So what profit is it to sit on a, a, a parking lot or a dilapidated housing or a dilapidated building? There's going to be profit to be made. And so the, 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 uh, the, the plan, 20, 30 year plan, this is also happening in, for example, in Cleveland, the Cleveland mayor uh, decided to uh, determine that Glenville would be a new science and technology corridor. That's, that's language that says, expect multiple dollars to come into this space for infrastructure and any number of circumstances and that starts the race for the developers to come into that space and get in and advance in preparation so this notion that you don't see it is just totally ridiculous it, it's not going to pop up in your face and say boogity boo i'm gentrification that's not what is happening by the time that's popped up They've already started. They're midway through the race. Now, I don't say this to say that it cannot be hindered or halted or at least redirected, but it is to say that this is a longer term process that we see in operation. And right now, what you're seeing is a combination of pressures that are now coming together. After what happened in 2008, that's another set of pressures that now combined with the plans and the efforts by cities to do economic development. So we have to understand that as economic decisions are not market, they're not these sort of entities and sort of abstract things. They're driven by people, right? So we have to understand that people are in operation driving these policies and then the policies help facilitate the market, which then operates and runs based on the, the policies that are in place. So no, it is, it is not, just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not in operation, okay? I do want to recognize uh, 
kind of commission just to fling me out of me. Real quick question. How do you turn the existing residents into stakeholders so they can participate mm -hmm. in the changes that are made in the community? Right. Go ahead. Uh, he has a question too. We'll just kind of take both. Okay. He says, um, she asked this uh, question as well. Oh. Okay. Oh, same question. Yeah. Who is it for? Anybody wants to answer? You go. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, lowering the barrier for involvement uh, and, and, and participating in the process, I think there's lots of different ways to do that. But uh, you've know, you got to think, think outside the box in terms of how you can get folks to. To participate so that's being outspoken um, you know I think you know looking at how do you make it easy for a CDFI or a, uh, mm -hmm. an entity that can su support uh, those projects to get involved in the process and so being right. transparent open uh, just gets just getting out in the community so it's it, it depends on the community and how you get your information but you've got to think of lots of different ways so you could do that through the community surveys you could go out to events where folks are already uh, Gathering in the community, say, "Hey, can we set up a table in the corner and talk about this issue?" Um, you know, it doesn't need to be a long meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, set up specifically for that project. You know, in the regional work we do, oftentimes our best opportunities are going out to that annual barbecue where the whole community is out there and getting some some input on whatever the project is. Because so. yeah. I think you should. You should be open. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we face the same struggle when we're working with homeless folks, but how do we make sure that the work that we're doing and trying to build out to end homelessness is inclusive of their needs and desires? I think you have to not just invite folks to the table, you have to make sure the table comes to them. Mm -hmm. You can't expect folks who are living their daily lives, who this is, they don't have a profit motive, this isn't their professional work, to be able to drop everything that they're doing to come to your table, you really have to bring the table to them. Um, I just really quickly, I would just really co-sign what they said, but also I think it's important that people understand what's happening to them, right? It, it's a question of them feeling like there are no avenues by which they could talk to people or get assistance or help. Um, and so I, I think just for those, special, especially civil rights organizations, they're already, and, and community groups, they're already operating in those spaces. But I can tell you, doing Partners uh, works individually with people in the community. They go door to door. They do all of that sort of hands-on interaction that allows the whole community to know that if there's a problem, they can go straight to Durham's in partnership. All right, so that, I think, helps too. I have one question, you know, it sounds silly, <clears throat> but why do y'all have your meetings in the middle of the week when the workforce can come? Mm -hmm. You asking people about Piedmont Tribe? <laughs> what meetings are you talking about? He said, oh, this meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, we've got a community meeting in Kernersville tomorrow that we're working on, and you know, we had it in the evening, and we got complaints that it wasn't early enough in the afternoon, so we had to open up the time for that from you know start of 5:30 up to 3:30 to get get folks out. So, uh, but I can't answer on behalf of that. I mean, you've got to you've got to you can't be one meeting. I mean, it's got to be a continual conversation. Right. I think that would be the answer to that question. Is that mm -hmm. you know, folks are just not going to come to meetings necessarily or can't you know if you're not providing child care you're losing out on on uh, moms uh, uh, and dads that are having to provide child care so there's some things and some costs and some you know thinking through that you really need to, to do to enable full participation so that's one thought and I will say there are institutions that do things at different times. So Cleveland State University, I've, I've worked with them. There's a uh, brother, Mordecai, he does work, uh, and it's mostly in the evening or on the weekend. 
Uh, Saturday is difficult because that's when people get up, they clean up, they do their errands and that kind of thing, but uh, they do try to work on either evenings or Saturdays. Cleveland is super churchy uh, Sunday, and so Sunday is, is pretty much an out day. Um, but I think, let me say this, I think there is sort of, um, there's a space or a function for events like this because sometimes I think it's helpful for uh, people to be in conversation with each other so that ideas spread and they take it back to their individual spaces, but also where we can begin to challenge each other because as a historian, I have a totally different point of view than some of the people that I hear talking and, 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 and giving a talk. And quite frankly, as much as I recognize their perspective, I think they need to hear what it means as uh, a historian to see this from a, a long view. So I think there are spaces for having having conversations like this, but I, I absolutely agree. It should not be limited to this. Uh, if this is the one time and the only time, then yes, I would say, yeah, you need to do this multiple times and multiple times of the year at different locations, locations, <laughs> different evening times, uh, that kind of thing. That brother has been wanting to talk for a long time. Go ahead. I apologize for what you said. I want to understand why mm. I never really heard anyone speak from a um, hyper racial mm -hmm. perspective. I didn't hear nobody really say anything mm -hmm. about the black population. And um, if in this city, certain neighborhoods were kind of redlined to take all the wealth out of the communities, mm -hmm. when these CDFIs and all that come back, will that be? Mm -hmm. Address for a racial equity lens mm -hmm. so that you know all the minorities, the women, the, the rich people, whatever going on, when they come rushing in trying to get the money, and people are very mm -hmm. not educated in how to go about right. getting into these opportunities, how are we going to be educated in how to, you know what I mean, put pressure on the opportunity zones right. and, and access this money and stuff like that? Right. So, how is it really going to help the black people who? have been shown to be the least economically mobility right. in probably the whole country. Mm. How is that going to be addressed? Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we're running late, so I'm going to make this quick, and then we'll, I'll talk afterwards. So a couple of things. One, CDFIs are designed to be community-based, which is why I distinguish that from credit unions. Okay, so there's no way uh, with CDFIs with this intent of not making profit that you can have a circumstance where, let's say, some sort of random business can come in to work with the CDFI. The CDFI is designed to ask the specific question of how does it work with this community. Now, really quickly, credit unions could, can function the way they're supposed to. Most people don't know, as a credit union member, you can get on the board. And so uh, folks who have credit union accounts, you need to push and or community groups that have money and credit unions, you need to get on those boards and make them do their job. Now, when it comes to who does the job, I'm talking specifically about community organizations and groups in part because they specifically work in this area. My father is almost 80 years old. I don't expect him necessarily to be out there on a regular daily basis. This is why I'm speaking more to organizations involved in this, this, this process. Um, and I, um, Oh, opportunity zones and, and focusing on opportunity zones. There are a lot of philanthropic, uh, philanthropic organizations, big ones, who are also looking at these opportunity zones and they are not happy. So there are potential partners that small local groups can create with the big money people because let's just call it what it is, nonprofits need access to money to do some of this stuff to apply that pressure. But minimally, I believe in putting people on shame street. I don't have no problem with shaming people. This is why when you see my, my cards and it says, well, who is involved in gentrification? Johnny Joe, he right there. We're, I, we're not gonna hide because that's part of the problem with gentrification is it operates in the dark until all of a sudden it's visible. So even if organizations lack the wherewithal to challenge those things, minimally what they can do is put them on front street. 
And that in alone is powerful because they're busy trying to do it in the back so that nobody sees. So just by cutting on the light, uh, that can be just as effective, even if you're not, you know, going into law, you know, a lawsuit or something like that.